Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome again to Church History and Renewal. Uh, we're going to begin this class just by looking at just a basic, simple examination of, of church history and history in general, uh, considering all the implications and even uh, the biases they, that we enter into uh, when we look at history. And quite frankly, we all have biases. Uh, it's just it just helps to recognize what those biases are uh, to help us understand history better. So first, let's begin with the syllabus. Um, I encourage you to read through it. I'm only just going to highlight a few important things. Of course, you have your textbooks, uh, your Stanley Burgess textbook, your Alistair McGrath textbook, and um, and you're going to want to focus on those and submit a weekly reading journal. You also have your very important weekly discussion forums. Uh, be sure and look at the details in the syllabus regarding that. You have an initial post. You're also going to need to respond to the postings of at least two or three other students in the class. In addition, every week on Friday morning, typically, I add an additional question just to keep the uh, subject matter going, to keep the discussion going. And I want you all to briefly look at that question and answer that as well. But every week, you need to be really timely with these discussion forums because that's the one area uh, where I don't accept late work. Uh, of course, I do accept sometimes in, in a lot of cases with your reading journals and with your essay and your research paper, uh, you'll get docked for it if you turn it stuff in late. Um, uh, but with your discussion forums, because it's interactive and it's timely, I do not accept late work. So you have to get all of it done by Sunday night every week. So be, keep on top of that. We also have a weekly uh, live session, and I'm going to submit a, a, a survey early in the week just to find out from everybody what's the best time to meet. Uh, gives all of us a bunch of options. Of course, I understand not all of you can make the live sessions as much as possible. If you can do that, we will record them. Uh, if you don't make the live session, you will need to just send me a quick email, three things you learned from it, so you can get uh, credit to help with your um, class participation grade. Um, so anyway, you also have a, a mini essay for this class, a research paper, and of course, a final exam. Um, but um, let's, um, let's uh, ask, where, where do we begin in this class? Uh, we begin, obviously, in the Book of Acts, where church history began, uh, where we have this uh, discussion where the author, uh, likely Luke, uh, writes this um, uh, writes this um, account to Theophilus. Uh, as they wait in Jerusalem, he says uh, that Jesus promises them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my promised Father, which you have heard from me, uh, heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few, few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um that's where church history begins. Really, it actually begins in the next chapter, technically, with the baptism and the Holy Spirit in the upper room. Uh, and, and traditionally, that's where we look at, at where the history of Christianity begins and expands. Uh, but let's take a minute to look about history in general. Uh, what does it mean? It relies primarily, um, mostly on primary sources. I know in our initial study in high school, and even in undergraduate school, we, we rely probably more on secondary sources. But history as a science relies primarily on primary sources. Those original authors who wrote about the events who were preferably eyewitnesses uh, or within a generation of the event, um, those help paint a very important picture. Also, sources that are critical to the account, that don't give complementary uh, accounts of the of of the issue at hand are taken to a, into account as well, um, and uh, we'll look a little bit at that. Some of the early uh, historians and people that didn't give a uh, always give a glamorous account of what happened in the early er, early church. Um, but let's take a minute look at this timeline of church history. If you can see it, uh, look at it. If you can't see it very well in this video. 
uh, look at it online in, in Blackboard, uh, and take a minute to look at it. Because what you see is you see a timeline of church history that quite honestly is accurate. It gives all the accurate dates and significant events that take place in church history from the beginning uh, through the modern age, but uh, it's also biased. And it's important to recognize this simply because most of you probably won't agree with this timeline. It's accurate, historically accurate, but it is also biased. It helps us, I think, recognize our own biases. Uh, I'd like you to consider who, you know, conjecture who wrote this and maybe mention it in your discussion forums this week uh, because it's, um, it gives some good interaction um, because it's written from a tradition that is probably most likely none of ours, uh, although I'm making an assumption there. So, um, but anyway, um, what are some, you know, um, good examples of primary sources in, in um, modern historical events when we consider church history today? You can certainly consider biographies of people. You could even consider YouTube as a primary source as it gives video accounts of events taking place in church history and history in general today. Um, but there's a variety of sources today uh, and a variety of sources in, in church history as well, including biographies, archaeology that validates the events and, and other areas of, of primary history. Um, you know, one of the things about church history, again, as I said, we all have biases, but uh, it helps to understand those biases to help give us a, what Hans Gadamer suggests is a historical horizon upon which we can stand and more accurately see the events at hand. Um, uh, he's a wonderful modern philosopher. I encourage you, if you have, have time, uh, maybe to consider reading his seminal work, Truth and Method. Um, lastly, what when you consider church history, it's also important to reflect upon what is what is your history and how does the, this affect your understanding of history? Um, you know, mine is biased because um, my introduction to Christianity took place at the height of uh, of the charismatic movement and the Jesus people movement. I, I was invited to a Bible study where there were, was a room full of hippies speaking in tongues, and that forever etched an influence my understanding of Christianity. And uh, and I am I fully admit I am biased because of that. But it helps me having that bias and understanding that bias helps me to understand and more accurately reflect upon the events as I look at them in church history as a whole. Uh, Here's another example of bias. I want, to, I want you to look at some of these pictures. These are portraits of Jesus throughout church history. Here's a very traditional one. Uh, here's one from a different culture. It shows the baby Jesus being hold, held by Mary. Um, but look at the portrait closely. It's an older portrait. It's actually from the Mediterranean. And here's a portrait of Jesus from Ethiopia. Uh, notice again, it, it reflects the culture. It also reflects the bias of church history because, again, we all perceive church history and often we even perceive Jesus himself from our own cultural background. Um, and um, here's another Mediterranean perspective of Jesus. Uh, this is one taken uh, as in a kind of a uh, a theoretical view of who Jesus might really have looked like. He was obviously born in a Jewish culture in the Mediterranean. Uh, he was neither European or African, as, as many of some artistic assumptions make. Um, but here's a few others. Here is Jesus on the cross. Here is Jesus uh, risen from the dead and ascended to heaven. Uh, again, two very different portraits. Um, but uh, boy, I'm already running out of room on my recording, so we're going to have to make this a two-part video, unfortunately. 